Uh, I'm Dennis Breed. I'm a student here at Unity Village, and it's my honor to introduce our second speaker, uh, Ms. Aileen Fitzke, who have, holds a master's degree in feminist spirituality, and the title of her presentation is Reimagining Incarnation. Help me welcome you. Imagining reincarnation, that's a different topic. <laughs> it's not what I'm going to be talking about. So. <laughs> um, our Earth is crying out for justice. Global climate change, peak oil, degradation of the Earth through unsustainable agricultural and mining processes, inequity of resource distribution, and the dumping of toxic waste in poor urban areas are but some of the ecological dilemmas facing our society today. Cultural historian Thomas Berry writes in his book, The Great Work, about the causes. The deepest cause of the present devastation is found in a mode of consciousness that has established a radical discontinuity between the human and other modes of being and the bestowal of rights on the human. The other than human modes of being are seen as having no rights. They have reality and value only by their use by the human. In this context, the other than human becomes totally vulnerable to exploitation by the human. And I would add that there are certain persons who also are part of the human enterprise. Ecofeminist theologian Yvonne Gabara writes, a group of poor women in, women in my region in Brazil was unable to accept the fact that within the regime of economic liberalism, the poor are not regarded as persons and among the poor, women even less so. However, there seems to be a shift starting, a change in consciousness that is incorporating the more than human world into human thinking about the health of the planet. Joanna Macy, eco-philosopher and Buddhist scholar, writes about the great turning, a move from industrial growth society to a life-sustaining society. She sees signs that such a turning is happening, and she sees it as a collective vision to choose life. To choose life in this planet time, she writes, to choose life in this planet time is a mighty adventure. As people in countries and all walks of life are discovering, this adventure elicits more courage and enlivening solidarity than any military campaign. From high school students restoring streams for famine spawning, to inner city, inner city neighborhoods creating community gardens in vacant lots. From forest activists, activists sitting in trees to delay logging until the environmental impact studies are done, to windmill engineers bringing their technology to energy hungry regions, countless groups are organizing, learning, and taking action. Joanna Macy sees the great turning occurring in three areas that are different though mutually reinforcing. These are holding actions that slow the damage to the earth and its beings, the analysis of structural causes and creation of alternative institutions, and a shift in perception of both and a shift in perceptions of reality both cognitively and spiritually. How will Christianity fit into the great turning? I'd like to suggest that one way that it might fit into the great turning is through reimagining the idea of incarnation. By removing the incarnation from a particular event that happened 2,000 years ago and bring it into an ongoing event that happens all the time, the meaning of incarnation can change for us. If God with us, God in our midst, God present in bodily creation is an ongoing process, then we can ask the question, what is included in the body of God? I will explore the incarnation and new ways of looking at it through the works of Marjorie Hewitt Shockey and her notion of radical incarnation, and then build on the notion of radical incarnation by looking at the works of Sally McFaig and Yvonne Gabara. In traditional understandings of Christianity, Incarnation and embodiment have tended to be relegated to the second person of the Trinity in the doctrine of Christ, but not in the doctrine of God or Spirit. 
Early Christian theologians, from Paul to the early church fathers, were influenced by the Greek dualistic assumptions of the superiority of sacred over secular, God over humanity, spirit over matter, transcendence over imminence, heaven over earth, spirit over flesh, male over female, and humans over and apart from nature. This influence affected enlightenment thought, which then imagined nature as a mechanistic entity which human beings could plunder, plunder and experiment with without limits, and we are feeling that influence even today. Imagining Jesus as the exclusive way God has been embodied limits the potential of divine presence and creativity in the world and reinforces the dualistic mindset that places God and spirit apart and distant from the world. Joanna Macy talks about analyzing the structural causes that have brought us to this place of environmental crisis. That dualistic mindset which places God and humanity above and separate from the more than human world must be overturned so that we can see the inextricable connections and interdependence between God, humanity, and the more than human world. In doing so, we can, as Joanna Macy says, shift our perceptions of reality both cognitively and spiritually. Margaret Sushaki's notion of radical incarnation springs from her thinking about God in a pluralistic society. How can we say that Jesus is unique or that he represents the only way in which God has incarnated into the world? What does that say about other religious traditions? What does it say about God's relationship with all creation at all times? Does the idea of incarnation as something that happened only once deny the possibility that God is present in the world at all times? That is, that God is radically imminent in the world. God reveals God's self through the working of the human and more than human world. As a process, theologian Sushaki imagines that God grounds the possibilities of the world. She imagines God and creation in a call and response relationship. God is the influence that calls all creatures into their own becoming. In responding to the call, each creature takes into itself a bit of the influence of God. That bit of God's influence into each piece of creation, humans, animals, plants, the evolutionary impulse to creativity from the earliest forms of life, is God incarnate in the world. Sushaki writes in her book, Divinity and Diversity, quote, but if God offers possibility drawn from the resources of divine life, then one could imagine that by receiving the influence of God, the reality that embodies that influence is to one degree or another an incarnation of God in the world. Incarnation, then, would be radical, not to a single person, but possible throughout existence." Unquote. Sushaki does not deny that Jesus holds a special place within Christianity, but she interprets that place within the framework of response to God's influence. She writes, quote, because his influence is toward the enactment of God's call toward inclusive well-being, those creatures not only who receive the call, but act on the call, witness to God's imminence in the world, end quote. And she goes on to write, quote, in the Christian tradition, we call this form of imminence incarnation, and have traditionally restricted it to Jesus Christ. But in process of relational theologies, God's imminence in the world comes to expression wherever God's <coughs> call is actualized. Jesus is a revelation of the incarnational God through the wholeness of his response to God. This does not negate or eliminate other forms of God's imminence in the world. To the contrary, it is a revelation of God in Christ to be a witness of how God works in the world. This radicalizes incarnation, saying that when God's aims are enacted anywhere, to that extent, God is incarnate in the world. That God is imminent in the world is a given. How God is imminent depends on the context. Environmental theologian Sally McFaig sees Christianity's seduction into dualistic thought as one of the basic ways in which Christianity has contributed to the indifference to and destruction of the life of the earth and all its creatures. In her book, A New Climate for Theology, she writes, quote, 
God and all things spiritual, heavenly and eternal, are perfect and exalted above all things material, earthly and mortal, with the latter being entirely different from the former and inferior to it. It is difficult to overstate the importance of this assumption, the dualistic hierarchical relationship of God in the world, for it not only encourages an understanding of salvation as the escape of individuals to the spiritual world, but also justifies lack of attention to the flourishing of this world. If God is spirit and creation is matter, then God does not occupy the earth and we need not attend to it either. God's, what if, asks McFaig, what if all life, God's and ours, as well as all others on earth, was seen to be on a continuum, more like a circle or a recycle symbol, than a dualistic hierarchy? What if spirit and matter were intrinsically related rather than diametrically opposed? Would it not turn our eyes to the earth, whether we are searching for God or trying to understand where we belong within it? McFay posits a model of God that is appropriate for our time, a model that incorporates our need to look at our impact on the earth and all its creatures, the model suggests is the world as God's body. She writes, quote, it understands the doctrine of creation to be not primarily about God's power, but about God's love. How can we all live together, all of us, within and for God's body? It focuses attention to the neighbor, the neighbor on the earth, on meeting God not later in heaven, but here and now. We meet God in the world, and especially in the flesh of the world, in feeding the hungry, healing the sick, and reducing greenhouse gases. <laughs> An incarnational understanding of creation says nothing is too lowly, too physical, too mean a labor if it helps creation flourish. We find God in caring for the garden, in loving the earth well. This becomes our central task. Climate change then becomes a major religious, a major Christian issue. To be a Christian in our time, one must respond to the consequences of global warming. McVeigh goes on to write, incarnationalism means that transcendence becomes radical imminence. Christians are invited to imagine the entire universe, all matter and energy, in their billions of differentiated forms, as God with us, or more accurately, as the body, the matrix in which we live and move and have our being. This model asks us to play with the possibility that Christianity is not about two worlds. Rather, the world as God's body suggests there is one world, one reality, and this world, this reality, is divine. The divine is physical as well as spiritual, as we, all of us, are. There is no absolute line dividing matter and spirit, body and soul, nature and humanity, or the world and God. This idea of incarnation explicitly suggests that everything is intimately related to everything else, and that the needs of the flesh are intricately intertwined with those of the spirit. Those things considered mundane becomes those, become those things that are most basic to survival. McVeigh writes, an incarnational religion demands that we pay attention to the flesh, the body, the most basic needs of others. The God who is with us, in whom we live and move and have our being, is a God who does not seem to care so much about our spiritual or religious needs as about our ordinary ones. Long life, houses to live in, food to eat, enjoyable work, healthy children, peace and well-being among all creatures. She goes on to say that an incarnate religion demands an incarnate spirituality, a spirituality of the body. She writes, hence, issues of global warming become religious issues. Clean air and water, food and shelter become works of the spirit. When life is seen as intrinsically valuable and all life exists in networks of interrelationship and interdependence, then there is no split between spirit and flesh religion concerned mainly with spirit. An incarnate religion refuses to allow well-off people to pacify the poor with promises of eternal life, while their ordinary lives lack the necessities for decent existence. 
This is seen for what it is, an ingenious maneuver by those of us with ample material goods to other human beings and life forms. Brazilian eco-feminist theologian Yvonne Gabara comes to her understanding of the interrelationship of all things through her work with poor women in Latin America and her understanding of the intersection of women's oppression and the oppression of the earth. She writes about how in times of oppression and war, the effects on women and the earth go unreported. In her book, Longing for Running Water, she writes, the use of nature, of flora and fauna, and of women as weapons in war and conquest get little attention in our analysis. It is barely noted in our body of so-called historical knowledge, and, almost, and it's almost never treated with an important ethical consideration. She goes on to write, we usually count the dead in war, but we almost never mention the destruction of the environment, the death of animals, the poisoning of natural springs, and the destruction of the present and future means of, of survival for those who have not been killed. Women who have been raped or killed who have cared for the wounded go unremembered. We do not mention the interdependence of all life systems, even though it's present everywhere. It is from this starting point that Gabara starts to form her ideas on interdependence and rethinking the traditional ways of understanding Christianity, in which the distance or discontinuity between God's life and human life continues to be underlined. She asks the question, is Christianity feasible apart from the traditional philosophical framework? Gabar begins with what she calls knowing, because knowing is the most plausible way we have found to say something to one another about the mystery we are and in which we have our being. She writes, the existential drama of the individual human being can no longer be blown out of proportion as if it were an isolated situation. Instead, we know from experience that the pain of the whole is mysteriously felt in every being. To be aware that our tragic existential situation of tribulation, violence and destruction, as well as of joy, tenderness and hope, lived out in an intimate relationship with the whole of our cosmic body, opens us gradually to a new understanding of our human condition. What we call human is probed in its astonishing association with and dependency on what we call the non-human. We need to seek a new understanding of our personal existence within the larger self that is the sacred body of the cosmos. Gabara uses the Trinity as a metaphor for that which is marked simultaneously by multiplicity and by unity, by the differences among all things and by their articulated interdependence. She extends this metaphor to the vastness of the cosmos and the heavenly bodies within, to the earth in its relationship to geological time in an ongoing process of creation and destruction, to the mountains, seas, and atmosphere of the earth, to the living beings, plants, and animals that populate the earth, to the relationships of people and cultures, to personal relationships, and to the relationship of the human to itself. All are expressions of the creativity of the universe. All are in intricately related and interdependent. For Gabara, incarnation is found, therefore, in God's relatedness to all things. We will not speak of a God of life, sorry, but of <laughs> life as divine milieu. We will not love other persons as the world itself on account of a superior being who creates, <coughs> loves, and saves all creatures. The invitation to love and mercy does not come from a reality that is external to us. Rather, it is an urge that is present in our very humanity. She explains how she sees the relationship of Jesus to divine incarnation. I believe that to affirm the incarnation or the bodyliness of the divine does not necessarily require that Jesus have some unique metaphysical character. The presence of the greatest of mysteries in our flesh is more than Jesus of Nazareth. We could say that Jesus is for us the metaphor of divine presence, the unfathomable mystery, the un in the human flesh in which we are all included. The incarnation refers to our own bodily reality. In other words, we apprehend in our own bodily experience what we call divine. I have tried to show in the writings of Marjorie Shushaki, Sally McFaig, and Yvonne Gabara that there are ways of reimagining incarnation that might be beneficial to our understanding of the earth and our relationship to it. The ideas expressed by these theologians are not new. 
They are merely theological articulations of what many people have already sensed and indeed have known for a long time. To see the whole world and all its creatures as sacred has been the norm in indigenous cultures, centered spiritualities, and within the mystical traditions of Christianity itself. That these theological ponderings have occurred at this time is, I believe, part of a larger movement of the Great Turning. Joanna Macy writes, when we make common cause on behalf of the earth community, we open not only to the needs of others, but to gifts. This is part of the nature of synergy, the first property of human living systems. As parts self-organize into a larger whole, capacities emerge which could not possibly have been predicted and which the individual parts could not possess. The weaving of new connections brings new responses and new possibilities into play. In the process, one can feel sustained and is sustained by currents of power larger than one's own. As people of faith who can participate in the Great Turning, we can reimagine the universe, the earth, as part of the body of God. In doing so, we can start to think of ways in which we can live with greater understanding of the earth's systems and our influence on them. We must stop thinking of the more than human world as something apart and different from the human world. Rather, we need to see how we're intimately related and inextricably linked. And I'll end with a story that I think describes what I was trying to say in this paper. There was once an old monk who one night was visited by the risen Christ. They went on a walk together in quiet intimacy, enjoying each other's presence. Finally, the old man turned to Jesus and asked, When you walked the hills of Palestine, you mentioned that one day you would come again in all your glory. It's been so long. When will you return for good? After a few moments of silence, the resurrected and living one said, When my presence in nature all around you, and my presence beneath the surface of your skin, is as real to you as my presence right now, when this awareness becomes second nature to you, then I will have and return for good. The dream was very vivid and carried the monk into the next day, when deep in thought he walked again, this time by himself. And bent over a small pond to wash his face, he gazed for a brief but eternal moment at his reflection and at the image of the trees and the sky reflected in the water as well. And he heard a gentle whisper, You are my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Mm -hmm. <laughs>